Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for this um, special sample lecture event we have with one of our professors, um, Anne Stone. So um, before I get started with our introductions, I would like to acknowledge that the UBC Point Grey campus is situated on the traditional, ancestral, and ceded territory of the Musqueam people. I would like to acknowledge that you are joining us today from many places, near and far, and acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of those lands. Um, so thank you everyone again for joining us from um, all places. Um, feel free to pop in the city that you're joining us um, from um, in the web chat. And we do have staff here that are, can answer your questions as we go along this um, special event that we have tonight. But first I would like to introduce our special, special lecturer for tonight. Um, Anne Stone has been a lecturer in the Marketing Behavioral Sciences Division at UBC Sauter for over 10 years. Her expertise includes marketing, advertising, branding, and promotional strategies. Prior to teaching at UBC Sauter, Anne was Vice President of Coca-Cola and Dairy Queen. Um, so Anne's lecture tonight is on um, positioning a core marketing skills. So um, join me in welcoming, um, welcoming um, Professor Anne Stone and um, Anne, I'll let you take it from there. Beautiful. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this evening's activity. Let me share my screen and we will leap into it. Um, oh, that's just special. Give me just half a second. My Zoom did something a bit peculiar and I figure, there we go. Fantastic. All right. So uh, today I'm going to talk a little bit about marketing and positioning. Now, for some of you, depending on what your background is, this is like, oh my God, I totally know this because maybe this is an area of your particular expertise. For some of the rest of you, this may be that topic that you never thought you really would ever engage in. Marketing, if you're looking at an MBA, is one of the set of skills that we believe is important to deliver to students. But for each one of you, whether or not that's relevant to what you want to do post MBA, probably up for grabs in terms of conversation. Um, so I want to acknowledge that I'm going to have everyone from, I could teach this, oops, I'm on the other side, I could teach this to, I don't even know what you're talking about. So there may be some moments where it won't exactly fit you. That's okay. Hang with us and uh, we'll, make, we'll make things happen. Uh, so my background to just a little bit of it so you see where I come from. Uh, I have an MBA, but not a PhD. A lot of the professors you're going to meet if you join us in this program or any program, quite candidly, you will likely have a mix of people like me who are referred to sometimes as practitioners, meaning I have experience at being a marketing person. And you can see some of the work that I've done there. Um, this is a planned second for career for me. Uh, I loved being a chief marketing officer, which is what I was towards the end of my career, and I thought it was a great career, and I enjoyed it immensely, but I had always planned on using the skills that I had learned through my career and sharing those back with others. I love the field of marketing. I love being part of business. Uh, there's nothing I enjoy more than sitting down with somebody with a gnarly business problem and hashing it out and having those conversations. So for me, this was a wonderful move, but it may lead you to the, okay, well then what would the rest of the instructors I would interact with be like? If I focus specifically on marketing and behavioral science, which is the faculty I'm a part of, it's actually a pretty broad range of folks. The first thing out of the gate I wanna tell you though is, um, oh my God, are these humans smart? Now, what do I mean by smart? I just looked up some of the statistics of the professors that teach. Number one, they are number one ranked in Financial Times for the number of publications per professor. Fin financial Times generally seen as one of the very best evaluators of MBA programs. And they're saying, hey, wait a second, the research faculty, now I'm not a researcher, right? So these are my compatriots who are research faculty. Um, of the research faculty, they are, stuffed full of some of the most amazing ideas you can imagine. Then let's look at, well, how do they rank within UBC? We just had another one of our professors named as the number one teaching professor across the UBC campus again this year. I believe that brings our total to three. 
um, which given that there's an awful lot of professors across campus is a pretty extraordinary comment. I also can say that just down the hall from me, David Hardesty, Kate White, um, Kirsten, um, isn't that funny? I can't think of Kirsten's last name. I guess that's a good thing. It means I see her every day and I don't remember what her last name is, but um, uh, Kirsten, Darren Dahl, uh, Joey Hogue, uh, you know, I could, I, I could go on forever. And what I would end up telling you is these are humans who in the past three to five years have won things like Darren Dahl was the number two teacher on the globe in a competition sponsored by The Economist about seven or eight years ago. An extraordinary experience where he flew to London and did a teach off with four professors and was named number two. And then uh, in his acceptance speech said, it's almost fitting that a Canadian is number two and quite humble about it, which I thought was adorable. Um, but we also have professors who have done extraordinary things, including several publications in the Harvard Business Review over just the past couple of years. There's particular expertise in behavioral insights. Some of you may know these by the term nudge, which was brought into kind of our lexicon or our conversation by Richard Thaler and some of his co-writers. But this is an entire area of expertise, very new, very exciting. Um, it builds off some of the foundational work from uh, Daniel Kahneman and uh, uh, Tversky is his last name. It starts with an A and I'm not coming up with that name either, but there you go. And uh, some of their work in the 70s that was really important, 80s, which was very important. That's where people like Dick Thaler came in. Uh, 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 Berger, um, Jason Berger, um, Dan Ariely, I'm trying to think of some of the people I listen to. Um, you know, all of these folks have uh, areas there. I bring that up because I want you to see that the, these research faculty are working in areas of extreme interest, extreme focus, um, and they're fascinating humans to learn from. Jan Cornell, one of my compatriots, was named the one of the top 30 young professors in the world by Poets and Quants uh, just, I believe, two years ago. And he's an extraordinary professor and such a kind and gentle soul. So I hope you can tell by my enthusiasm for the people that I run into every day. At least within our population, it's extraordinary. Now let's just open it up a little bit and say, well, well what other kinds of professors are we going to get? They're just as good. I happen to know the qualifications of my faculty, but I also know I'm walking the halls every day with people who have won Killam Awards, which is the university-wide uh, teaching. I walk by people who are quoted all the time uh, in publications near and far. So what am I reassuring you? There's a lot of people like me that come with a really interesting perspective from business, from doing the work, and then that is complemented by professors who are going to bring research expertise in current topics right into the classroom. And I think the melding of those two ideas can re be really important. Now, um, as I think about teaching today, it occurred to me that maybe it might be helpful to actually talk about what a class might be like, because depending on how you think about it, a class may be a little bit different than you might expect. So let me walk through a little bit of how I perceive how classes are happening today. Most professors have significant pre-class prep. Now, when I say significant, that doesn't necessarily mean 17 hours of work. What it means is significant as in really carefully thought of and very relevant to where the instructor has designed the course to go. So what, what, what might that look like? Um, several instructors, myself included, will sometimes do a prepared video. We may have digested a bunch of information. We haven't found a great article. There isn't a great book. V not many of us use textbooks because we find them to be quite dated. Um, although we do use teaching notes from places like uh, Harvard, Ivy, NCED, those types of places. But um, Sometimes it's just better to hear one of us, kind of as I'm seeing you now, which is through a visualization. Now, in some instances, we may give you a video that comes from somebody else. Um, this isn't ripping off other free sites. It's more of, hey, there's some curated content from somebody we really think is relevant. Let's bring that into the, to the preparation. 
Now, academic readings absolutely are going to be part of it, but it could also include business and popular press readings. What I, one of the things I love about a business program is that it opens us up to the possibility that particularly in, in something like marketing, it can be really relevant to bring in what are today's ads look like? Um, what are the common uh, celebrities and what are they sponsoring? And that may be from People Magazine or McLean's Magazine or you know who knows what. Um, it just is important to get that information as it might be to have read an academic article. Um, and then there may be some exercises and assignments. Oftentimes you'll see a quiz. Um, hey, did you kind of digest what we need to have done as we go into the class? So that's phase one. A bunch of information that you gather, you do some learning, you kind of dig yourself into and get engaged. Phase two, that's the class. Now, this is the place where I want to pause. For some of you, it's like, oh, that, you know, doesn't the teacher teach me everything? Uh, not so much so. I want you to think about the preciousness that we've learned during the pandemic. What's important is time together. What I don't think is a productive time to spend together is for me looking at you in a marketing class and going wah, 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 like Charlie Brown's teacher, if you've ever watched a Charlie Brown movie. And that's not helpful. I want you to come to the class with some foundational learnings. I want you to come to the class with points of view about what you've reviewed. And I want you to bring that into the classroom so that we can talk about it. We can engage one another. So an example of, of things, and I've posted it kind of there is, we might open with a little bit of a lecture. It might be five slides, two slides, and it might be, hey, these are some of the things we covered. Were there any questions? Blah, blah, blah. Okay, great. Now, let's think about that thing that we were talking about, but let's explode it a little bit. Let's play with it a little bit. Let's Imagine what if we did this or push this in this direction? And that can be wonderfully fun because now you come in with a foundational learning and then you are instantly asked to apply it. And all the research that we've looked at would tell you that it's the application process that solidifies the learning in your mind. It takes it and it kind of codifies it and allows you to access it and work with it. So that's why I say reconfirm concepts and then build from there. Then there's discussion. MBA classes are, are fascinating as an instructor because the number of points of view that are brought into the classroom. I can speak very clearly from this just in a very current place. I've been really honored to be teaching the incoming MBA class in their second period, the, the basic marketing class, their kind of introductory marketing class. And I, we have everyone that you can imagine. There's software engineers, there's engineer engineers. Um, we have a couple people from oil and gas. We have people from all over the world. We have um, humans who have done advertising. We've had humans who have been writers. We've had humans who are doing research, biological research. We have people who had started down the career to be medical doctors and decided they really didn't want to be medical doctors. We've got all these extraordinary humans and when you bounce an idea by all of them, of course they're going to come up with a different ideas. And that, I think, creates extraordinary learning experiences. Typically in classes I'll teach, I'll ask people to work in small teams first. Small teams allow for intimate conversations. You can be uncertain about something with someone who's sitting next to you that you might not be willing to be in front of 50 or 40 of, of your classmates. And you can have more you know, learning opportunities, try ideas out. Then we go to the bigger, larger classrooms and those conversations merge together. My job is more like a concert master. Let's bring the violins in, let's bring the tuba in, let's bring this in, let's have a, let's have a robust concert, if you will. And um, that to me is, is one of the great joys of being part of an MBA program. I think it would be a miss if the instructors were coming in and talking at you. And I don't want you to expect that. I think you should be thinking about these as, oh my God, how much can I learn from everyone, right? We've shared this stimulating pre-class information. Now, how do we explode that into a really uh, robust learning experience? 
So that's what happens in class. Now, I rely a fair amount, you know, not, not extraordinarily, on what I call the post-class. Um, definitely things that may have been discussed, right? Your slides, everybody always wants the slides, give them the slides. But it also might be, hey, I mentioned this book, or here was something we went off in the tangent, but it was a great tangent, and we talked about this. And here's a resource I've, ident I've identified. Additionally, um, particularly in these classes, because there's only 10 sessions, right? So there's 10 sessions, approximately an hour and 50 minutes each. There's no way you can cover the, the, the massive dimensionality of the topics you're addressing. And so what's interesting to me, and I think many of the professors is to say, well, we talked about this, but let's give you some supplemental readings. If that day really turned you on, you're like, whoa, this was rocky. It's exciting to go to a post-class page and see three additional articles to read or a video to pick up or you know, it's something like that. Whereas if that was a day it was like, whoa, I am so glad I never have to take this again, then you can just pull down the slides if you need them and you don't have to look at anything else. So it becomes a more optional kind of build area. So I wanted to give you some perspective on at least a lot of my practice in teaching and I know it's shared with a lot of our other instructors. So that leads me to, so what in the heck is Anne's role? I see myself as a guide. I spend an enormous amount of time finding materials to stimulate these conversations. Hence why I say a really important job is my curation role. I may read 20 articles and select one that I think is good for students. And that I think is even more important in a time where I think we're learning just how challenging it can be to have so many multiple priorities and living in this kind of edge of hopefully drifting towards a new normal, whatever the heck that's going to look like. I think we're even more aware of making sure that if there's 20 articles, it's my job to find the one. And please don't have that be a 40 page article. I also need to prepare activities and sometimes even discussion stimuli to create the conversations that I know will bring out great learning experiences. In my case, I sometimes hand out worksheets. Hey, get with a couple of your buddies and chat this through. And sometimes I actually ask those to be handed in. Why? Because then I can give additional coaching moments on what, what I see on those papers. So I think that sets up some other things. So, and then the last part is creating assessments that prove to you that you know what you have and give me yet another opportunity for coaching moments. So, wanted to give you that as kind of a, a workload, a, a, an overview thing. Now, my perspective on the workload is it's significant but doable, but that's why there's amazing humans coming to talk to you later who've been through the program who can give you the real perspective on that because I'm an instructor and I'm not sure my, my uh, perspective on workload is all that valuable. Now, I wanted to now shift and say, that's a little bit of what a normal class would be, but this isn't really a normal class. So this is gonna be a little bit of setting the stage because you didn't do any pre-class work. I need to give you that, but then we are actually gonna have some conversations, all right? So I put out this provocative statement. Business would be better informed if marketing foundational skills were used in strategic decisions. I actually foundationally do believe this to be true. I've sat in C-level suites, so I think I've got a knowledgeable perspective to say that from. Um, but it's more designed to kind of, oh, she put out something provocative. Let's see what she's got to say about that. So what is marking? This is my definition of marketing. It's not from the AMA, the CMA, or any of the organizations you may imagine. And let me just pull apart a few, few things because it sets the foundation for what we'll talk about. Marketing is real life actions. It is not theory. It is, marketing is a full body contact sport. Every single day, your product is out there. It is being reacted to. You're talking about it. The pricing structure is being identified and your supply chain management issues are in there. And that's kind of the foundation of what marketing looks at. Although it goes off in many dimensions beyond that. What marketing tries to do is advise beliefs and actions in others beliefs and actions in others. Most of the definitions I see focus directly on actions, but I actually think sometimes it's more important to advise a belief. Um, and what I mean by that is, 
not every action we take happens right after we do something, but it might be something you learned from a long time ago. And I kind of sort of remember that and it kind of led me into this position to think about this. And so that's what marketing can do. You can have an impact years after someone's been exposed to the message. It is absolutely a blend of science and art. It is becoming now an incredibly data-centric profession, but yet equally balanced with art. And what I mean in art is not can you draw, but art as in what does our experience tell us happens in these situations? What are the current situations that are happening influence what would have happened in the past? Because of the very fast pace of society today, the past is not always a great predictor of the future. And the last one is marketing can happen with or without intent. And this is not the focus of this conversation, but it is to kind of put another provocative thought out there, which is we expect our brands, so all of the brands and the life we're a part of, we expect those brands to have points of view. If I was giving this talk 15 years ago, I would not have had this point of view. I wouldn't have had to talk about what's your brand's point of view? What charities are you involved in? What kind of nonprofit activities? What, what are your employees doing to assist you in communicating these messages? I, we wouldn't be having that conversation at all. But in today's world, we expect brands to have an opinion. We expect brands to have values and we want to align our, our actions, meaning our purchase decisions, with brands that echo the values that we perceive to, to have ourselves. Can only do that if you can see what the brand values are and then have the self-knowledge. So if that's happening, if a brand is not communicating to you what their brand values are, you are probably going to dismiss that brand because while they are just like, hey, we're just getting our act together, you know, we just need a couple more months here. The reality is in your brain, if you're in a purchase mode right now, they don't care enough to tell me what they believe, I'm moving on. And that can be a very critical moment in a brand decision-making process. Now, the simplified version of all of those words on the previous page is everything communicates. I always have to give credit. I learned this from Sergio Zeman, who uh, twice was the chief marketing officer of the Coca-Cola company. Um, personally, because if you go, oh, well, maybe I should read his books because he's got several. Um, my response would be, I think this is an incredibly smart comment. And I think this kind of covers uh, Sergio, but feel free to dig into his work. There's some really interesting things that happen there. I just think this is really one of the key takeaways. So to give you a definition of that, every action and activity has an impact on your target audience and every lack of action and activity has an impact. So that's important to see, right? It means that we need to remain open communicators with our target audiences and with the rest of the world. Now let's take a couple of examples of how that might come together. What I'd like you to do is just think quietly for a moment. I'm gonna open the chat. And if you have a point of view about what you think the Coke ad on the left and or what you think the Pepsi ad on the right is saying, um, put it into chat so we can see what's going on. Alternately, if you're comfortable, raise a hand and we'll invite you verbally into the conversation. So I'll give you a minute to think about that. Don't see any hands, but wondering if anyone's going to add something to chat here. Hello. Uh, hello, sorry, I don't know how to raise my hand. <laughs> oh, uh, that's okay. That's all right. Um, there's there's a reactions button, um, and I since ah, reactions. I, all right, I see. 
Okay. There you go. Well, fantastic. Since you're <laughs> already speaking, Ricardo, why don't you leap in? Tell us what you're thinking. Well, I, I understand what Coca-Cola is doing an indirect marketing because it's relating the sound of the open bottle or the open can with with uh, congratulations to I to IHOP. Right. That's what I'm seeing in the in the ad of Coca-Cola in this case. Excellent. So, to be honest, I don't no PepsiCo, uh, PepsiCo is not kind of famous in my country, so I'm from Peru. Mm -hmm. and <laughs> I cannot read what the message, the hidden message in, the, in, in that ad, to be honest. That's okay, <laughs> That's okay, Ricardo. I actually have two students right now who are from Peru, and <laughs> um, they have talked to me because Coca-Cola is in my history. They're like, oh no, in our country, Coca-Cola, very important brand. PepsiCola, yeah. not so much so. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, not, not at all. It, Coca-Cola <laughs> has a top brand in Peru. Cool. Well, 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 that's my answer. <laughs> Beautiful. I love it. We've got some lovely uh, builds in the, um, in the chat. And um, I love the comment of Coca-Cola seems to focus on themselves. Um, while I love the comment and I love the idea that, that Ricardo and some of you picked up on, I, I think it's really important to note Coke is about Coke. It's a picture of Coke. It's a picture of Coke doing things and it's about Coke. And oh, by the way, there's this tiny little IHOP program, a logo, and isn't that nice? Whereas as much as I consider visually the Pepsi-Cola ad to be a disaster, you know, could you have any more things going on there? The fact of the matter is it's pretty clear that it's about IHOP. And that's a very different perspective. Now, for some of you, you may go, yeah, 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 but this is a consumer thing. Let me remind you, this is a B2B sale. This is a B2B sale that we're looking at here. This isn't Coca-Cola talking about the customer who drinks the Coke. This is Coca-Cola talking about their customer IHOP who then turns around and sells that product to you as you have your pancakes or your scrambled eggs or whatever you have at, at IHOP that day. So this is a B2B uh, magazine placement specific to the restaurant industry. And I, I happened to have seen the ads and I immediately ripped them out because I thought it was, uh, as somebody, I've actually worked for both companies. Earlier in my career, I worked for Pepsi-Cola when they owned the Pizza Hut business. This is one of the single best examples I've ever seen of the difference of the corporate culture of these two companies. Coke is often referred to as arrogant and Pepsi is always about the promotion. And I was like, okay, there you go. Absolutely, that's exactly shown in these two ads. So it's uh, excellent. I mean, I saw so many of you picking that, um, picking that up in the, the messages, which I really very much appreciate. So there you go, example number one. We'll continue on to another example, won't we? And I'm actually, uh-oh, I'm gonna have to, don't worry, there's no cause for alarm. I'm gonna have to jump off, turn on sound and come back in. It takes about five seconds. Okay, so whoever pins me will want to pin me again for everyone. And you should be seeing a um, penguin on the screen. And so uh, if somebody could just put in chat, do you see the penguin on the screen? Yep, perfect. Okay, now what I need to see is I'm going to turn on the recording and we're going to see if it works. No stress if it doesn't, but we'll see if we can show this one. Here we go.
Okay. If you're like me, I always get a little weepy on that one. That's okay. Either, again, raise your hand or um, feel comfortable putting it in the chat. Both are fine. Don't feel like you need to, uh, to speak if it's not comfortable to you. But uh, who are these people? To, why would they do this ad? What, what's trying to happen here? So take a moment, type it in, shout it out, uh, whatever we want to do here. Yeah, um, the first one that I've seen come up is the John Lewis ads are a tradition and they absolutely are. That's why I said um, annual holiday ad. And now we've got is a motion of gifting to their brand and products. Yes, you're trying to, you're trying to connect the idea of, oh my goodness, this child has this entire world wrapped around Monty the Penguin. And wouldn't it be magical if you could actually do this and Oh, he can because he can go to John Lewis and pick up another stuffed penguin and then the two penguins can live together, right? So um, either Azar or Azar has brought up the idea of um, the credit card is how I always look at that comment. It's more for the parents than it is for the kids because uh, these are gifts. Um, in the marketing world, we often refer to that as who's the person with the credit card? Uh, you want to influence the person with the credit card because uh, as much as we like to think that children can virtually indefinitely impact us, the reality is, is that, let's face it, we all kind of go, yeah, 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 you've been talking about that for years and you're never going to get it. <laughs> so instead, you want to talk to the person who has the money, the, the ability to pay. And a touching, heartwarming ad, beautifully crafted, wonderful underlying music, a story that's easy to follow, is going to touch the hearts of the people who have credit cards. And that was what it was intended to do. To do. Now, Ricardo goes in there and says, is that like how Disney does it? And the reality is, is that Disney's actually kind of a two-tiered model when it, uh, when it does its marketing. Disney has an entire tier that's based on parents. It has a separate tier based on kids. This ad is probably more weighted towards parents, although I would think that most kids would find it enchanting. Um, it's really kind of more of a parentally focused one. And that's why we have... Um, you know, I'm trying to think about it. If you've watched any single Disney movie in your entire life, which I have to imagine all the humans on this call at some point have seen something from Disney, you know that every once in a while, one of the characters will say something that means one thing to the kids and one thing to the parents, or some visual that's absolutely hilarious to the parents and, and has no meaning to the kids. That's what I mean by it has uh, generally two tiers. So... Um, I have one more to show you. There's four separate ones. This is the second. What's going on here? What are they trying to convince people to do and how are they doing that in this particular set of advertisements?
safety, traveling a group, a bus company, they're trying to press safety in numbers. Yeah, being together is safer. It's, it's really interesting, isn't it? it? It is so differently engaging. They don't make it about you as the individual and someone. Instead, what they do is they make it about, oh my God, that's right, it is kind of fun when you do. So um, very fun. And you guys were absolutely picking up on the concept that was coming there. So if marketing is the one that's figuring out what to convey to whom to drive sales, then we start with the target audience. Who are we trying to communicate to? And in those ads, we're communicating to people who need to have transportation. We're talking to potentially parents or people who might be uh, getting gifts. And then in the one before that, um, the one before that, it was John Lewis. And then there was one before that. And guess what? You know, I'm having one of those nights. That's, that's not going to come to me. So we're trying to help people make a connection between my world. Thank you. It was Coke. Yes. Imagine that. I forgot the company I worked for at one point. We want, we want people to feel a connection to the brand that we're representing. And that's one of the core ideas. And to think that through, there's a technique called positioning. Now, this is the structure of a positioning statement. You don't need to memorize this. You don't need to do anything like that. This is, this is an opportunity to see what it's like to go through a learning experience. But in case it's useful, your target audience is the people you're talking to. The frame of reference is what they think about when they're talking about that type of brand or service. The point of difference is what makes that brand distinct, different? And the support is why do I believe that your difference actually exists or why should I believe that it's true? So it's, it's a relatively simple framework, enormously powerful when put in the purpose of businesses. Now, a side commentary that we will not delve into, this can be enormously powerful if you use this to position yourself. I'll put that out there as food for thought. Now, strategy does the exact same thing. And I wanted to, to have this as a perspective because sometimes it's as if well, strategy does this and marketing does this and the operations team does this and finance is over here. And in fact, I actually find that we're, we're healthier as business professionals. If we see the interlinking, if we see the adjoining points and how they work together. So in this case, a strategy generally calls this process value propositions. If you've done business model canvas, you're going to understand value propositions and value proposition canvases, and you're going to have worked through that process. If you have taken almost any tech entrepreneurship, you're going to talk about value propositions. So this is a very common framework that would have been used. And I want you to see that they both focus on who is your target audience. They both talk, talk to the uh, who else is the competition, which is that frame of reference. And they both focus on what makes you different. Why would somebody buy the brand in this hand versus the brand in that hand? Well, what's the difference there? So let's look a brief moment at some history because I always find these perspectives uh, interesting. You may find them useful. And uh, somebody just said, is a point of, point of difference as a USP? The answer is yes. So you would type reference. I know you mean difference. And the answer is yes, Vishal. That absolutely is what it is. So if you've learned USP, unique selling proposition, or in some cultures, unique selling point, um, that in fact would be a point of difference. Now, if you look at the kind of the starting point of where some of these ideas came from, it started with a group, uh, two writers called Rees and Trout. And they wrote a, uh, a presentation, a, an academic paper actually, in a group called Industrial Marketing. And that is when they presented the idea of positioning for the very first time. Now, you may have uh, you know, seen their books. They became quite popular as, in terms of writers, and that came later. But I'm going actually back to the academic roots of positioning, 1969. In 1996, Michael Porter, and many of us will have uh, referenced Michael Porter at single points, talked about the strategic position leads to sustainable competitive advantage. 
And again, many of us may have uh, learned that term, whether it's part of our previous education or the companies that you're working in now, you may have seen this type of a terminology. Now he hypothesized there were only three ways to position and they're noted there. Now that led to Kim and Mabong doing their work mostly through INSEAD and they came up with the idea of, no, 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 there's, there's a whole different strategy we need to think about and that is blue oceans. They called red oceans, the places where they were highly competitive and all as gross as this analogy is, there are sharks eating everyone in the water and there's blood everywhere. That's why there are red oceans. And there are blue oceans. Blue oceans do not have sharks and there's no eating going on. And the implication being is if you go someplace where you are so different that you're markedly different, that creates another opportunity. Now, in 2005, Young Mi Moon, who is based at Harvard, came up with another idea. And that other idea was that, um, and uh, to one of the people who's hosting, I've just noticed um, most of our guests have become unmuted or some of our guests have become unmuted. You could just double check that because I was getting some feedback. Um, and, they, and she came up with the idea that if everyone positions the same way, we need to be more clever. And she came up with some really interesting ideas. Why do I show this to you? Because it shows you that the evolution moving through this process of getting better and better and more refined in our skills of the core of a business, which is who are you talking to? What are you trying to do? And how do you differentiate yourself? Uh, thanks so much. Is is this, is this is something that strategy and marketing have been wrestling with and giving and taking to and from one another the skill sets that are um, so important in positioning. Now, I thought it would give us an interesting example of how this might come through. Um, and, uh, and this one's a little older, okay? So it's not a current example, but it's kind of fun and I had some really fun visuals. So I'm gonna walk through one and then we'll see how time is and we'll see if we do one um, as a team or, or not. And that is the Imes foods. This is pet food. And um, pet food for many, many years has been, you feed me like a farm animal, right? There's a feed store, you go to the feed store, you pick up the feed, you pick it up for the chickens and you pick it up for the cats and you pick it up for the dogs. And so it was a kind of functionality that was uh, so uh, foundational to how pets were handled. Then of course, there's one that we're not gonna talk about, which is then there was, you get the scraps, which was for pigs and dogs. And that was also a method of, you know, here's our leftover food. But then, you know, we have adapted and adopted pets into our lives as if they are a member of our family. And going to a feed store where there's cow people and horse people is no longer how we frame a cat or a dog. A cat or a dog lives in our home with us. They're part of our family unit. And Imes realized this incredible fact and started thinking about it, huh, wait a second, if that's how we think about our pets, we need to change the entire dialogue as to how we market our products. And to do that, they said, wait a second, we're, we're Procter & Gamble because that's who owns Imes. We have scientists, we understand things like gum health and muscular health and obesity and how do hearts work. And if we applied all of that understanding of chemical natures, and we applied that over to our pets, would that have impact? Would that have meaning? And the answer was, yes, it did. And that got me to, if I sold it to people that way, because they're already comfortable with this, this would be a way to in fact, help the health of our pets. But at the same time, talk to people like they were the pets, but family members we know them to be. Really important turning point in this category 
was this moment. Now, we could have a long conversation as to whether or not was this led by other small entrepreneurs who were doing some of the same ideas or not. The answer is probably yes. But the reality is, is that things change. They come to the Malcolm Gladwell tipping point when large companies take them over. And this was the first large company brand that did it. So they came out with um, products that were things like antioxidant blends, tartar fighting formulas, weight control, so that it made sense to the human and was good for the pet it was being purchased for. And that drove them from the number five brand worldwide to the number one brand worldwide. That's a pretty huge increase in market share, profitability, and everything else. And in fact, the, at the time, A.G. Laffley was the CEO of Procter and Gamble, Gamble, and his comment was, we're just offering consumers peace of mind. We're actually talking to consumers and our, our purchasers in a way that is correct. What kind of positioning would have gotten us there? You say to yourself, now my target audience is pet owners. And the frame of reference is the, the, what they're using to feed their pets. And what am I different? Our formulas make sense. And how do I support that? Because we know how to do these things. And again, look at my comment there, my kids, it makes sense for my kids. So we know how to do this. And oh, by the way, we use terms you're comfortable with that make sense. So that's kind of a marvelous way to kind of paint the picture of, oh my goodness, if you actually go through this process, it can lead to these breakthrough moments in which products, services, and the way you communicate them can all be refined. Now, what I'd like to do, and um, I'm actually going to ask, uh, you don't know that I'm doing this because you don't know everyone who's on this call, but Vivian, I believe I'm at the six minute mark. And if you could just confirm that into the chat, that would be great because I want to make sure I'm on the thing. Um, put into chat things that you know about the Starbucks brand, anything you know about the Starbucks brand. When you hear Starbucks, um, beautiful, 10 minutes, thank you. What do you think of? So if you could put that, ethical sourcing, beautiful, great, great opening comment. What else do we know? <laughs> Expensive, with an LOL. Um, white and green, so there's a color association that's coming from someone. Excellent. We'll see if a couple others pop up or not. Uh, discussions, yes, absolutely. And uh, work from the cafe, absolutely. The all famous Wi-Fi. Oh my God, they give me Wi-Fi, I can work from there. Um, high quality, presumably. Uh, Tata is the one that handles it in India, and that's absolutely can, uh, the, um, the thing, the intentional misspelling um, or the way that you think about misspelling. And then that leads to the whole memes of your Starbucks, uh, um, Starbucks things. And then Red Cups at Christmas. Beautiful work, guys. You have a really good sense of what this brand is about. Those are often some of the things we would consider to be points of difference. They do have red cups at Christmas and everybody loves them because we want to be seen trotting down the street or coming into our meeting with that red cup. So these are all wonderful examples. Now, um, who do you see there? Who do you see in a Starbucks situation? And I see Nashant, did you want to jump in? I see hand pop up. Maybe no. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Mistakes happen all the time. Trust me. Um, so, uh, so some of the people I see, I see people who work. I'm riffing off the people who mentioned, yeah, business people. You know, I see people who are there to work. They're riffing off the Wi-Fi. I see people who are there to chat with friends. I see people who are there um, who maybe have kids. Um, I see college students coming through. I think that's another group, particularly ones located relatively close to the campuses. Absolutely see them all the time. Um, and then you see moms. Sometimes in the early morning, you'll see retired folks sitting around and having a coffee together. Those would be potential target audiences, all of which are part of a larger group of people who are current customers, but there might be different ones that we want to talk to. And this one, I'm just going to take the answer on the bottom. The generic group that Starbucks is a part of is coffee shops. 
there's other places you can go and have a cup of joe and have a muffin and get some Wi-Fi and do the same things. So Starbucks competes against them. And so if you look at it that way, you're now already building a positioning. And I'm going to do this on the fly using some of the responses I saw that there, which is two entrepreneurs. Starbucks is the coffee shop that creates an essential business environment because the coffee is good, the Wi-Fi is free, and the people are friendly. That's positioning statement. Fantastic. That's how you would position it to entrepreneurs. Now, a very real situation that happened here in Canada, again, from a while ago, is that Starbucks realized that Canadian customers were really not happy with the dark roasts that were their heritage roasts. And they did have a lighter roast called creatively light roast, but it was not selling in Canada. And so they had a dilemma. We know that we have a product that should work. It's not selling. We know that people are not drinking. And if we don't get this fixed, no matter how nice our, our coffee shops are, people are not gonna come here as much as we would like to. So they created a positioning, my hypothesis. I didn't work at the firm at the time, but the target audience is Starbucks customers who prefer lighter roasts. The frame of reference would be the coffee flavors or roasts that you can order when you go to any of these uh, coffee shops. Their point of difference that they came up with is we're Canadian. Now, mind you, this is a clearly Seattle-based firm claiming Canadianness. And the support they gave was the blend, the roast, and the packaging are all about being Canadian. Now, depending on what time frame it was, this positioning may or may not have worked. As it turns out, it worked rather well. And I'd like to page through that for just a moment. This is what they did. They took their light roast and they put it in that package that you see on the screen. And they called it True North Blend but in a wonderful step that was just so bright and brought this positioning to light. This is the email that went out to people that said, you named it. They actually did a high involvement online ranking system that allowed them to use Canadians as the people who named their blend. And that was the name they came up with, True North. And they put a package in that has the West Coast Mountains, the Central Forest, the Plains and the Prairie, and the Maritime Shores. Now, I don't know if you intuitively would have caught all of that as you looked at the package, but it shows you just how much thought had gone into the process of bringing this brand together. So at this point, I wanted to kind of step back. We've got about five minutes left. And if anyone had any particular questions, right? So it could be about the lecture itself. What do you think about? Or why did you do this? Or why did you go down this path? But it could also be as general as you want it to be, such as, you know, what, what, what do you see in the, the program? What kind of students are you teaching? Anything you like, the, t the last five minutes are yours. So I'll see if anything pops in chat or if it comes up with a raised hand and we'll go from there. Hello, uh, this is the Azar or Azar. Um, hey, come on in. Me. Yeah, bring it on. Nice. Uh, my name's uh, pronounced Azar, by the way. It's like bizarre. Thank but you. No. Um, okay, so first off, thanks for um, showing us um, all the slides and your lecture and everything. It was, I like the way you presented it. Uh, my question is about class sizes. Um, how, how many people are in uh, a class? Sure. In the introductory classes, um, meaning everybody takes the, the first three, three periods of activities, you take together. Okay. Um, and those will be 
generally, depending on how many people they admit, half the class in each of them. Right now we're running about 50 people in each of the sections. Yeah, so, so that would be the class size for the first three groups. Yeah. Then you shift and you begin to take electives. When you get into electives, um, there's a huge variability because some people may want a really advanced finance class. Somebody else may want to take market research. Somebody else is really interested in data analytics. And depending on the mix of the class will determine how many students there are in classes. Generally, you would discover classes in the range of could be as large as 50, um, but many, many of the classes will be more in the 20 to 40 range. Mm. Um, because again, if you've got 100 to 150 people in the classroom, I, I, in the class itself, but there, during any single time, there might be 20 different electives to sort from, you can begin to see how there's many more classes that are going to end up with, with smaller class sizes. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I got it. Thanks. I, I like the approach of like having smaller classes and more collaborative. So that mm -hmm. sounds great. Cool. Excellent. That was the only hand I saw. What kind of case discussions happened in classes? Um, it, it's a great question. Uh, case conversations is definitely one of the tools that is used. I use it. A lot of professors use it. And the types of conversations would actually kind of follow the direction that I had outlined in terms of how do you prepare for, for classes and go through that process. You'll read the case up front. You'll probably be asked to give either a submission or at least come to class with the ability to share what would you do? Why would you do it? There might be some pointed questions, um, such as, you know, there's this idiosyncrasy or interesting element to the case. Dig into that and come ready to discuss that. Then what you would do is come into the classroom and it totally depends on what the instructor is trying to do. You might end up with everyone gathering together into small groups and having those, as I mentioned earlier, more collegial and you can try out some ideas that might not wanna to do to a bunch of people and have those smaller conversations then come together. You might end up starting with some general conversation. Let's just do the lay of the land. What are some of the case facts? Let's dig into those and then go into some of the specific questions and what we might see from that. Um, generally, towards the end of that time period of however long the instructors set up for a case conversation, then you would move to kind of a different perspective, which is, okay, so now let's talk about conclusions. Or the instructor may have those dangling new ideas of, ooh, and what if I did this to you? Or what if the time frame changed? Or what if the budget went from 100 million to 5 million? Right? What would you do if you had a lot less resources? What would you do if you had a lot more? So um, I've got somebody else and I'm at time. So um, one more question. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, I had a question about the split between creative aspects of marketing versus the practicalities and budget. Is that more towards the higher level classes? The answer is yes. Um, uh, you're going to find Wow, there's lots of great classes. Examples of classes that are going to be available for students in the track right now would be business development, which is going to focus on your sales and biz dev skills, um, consumer behavior. So digging into uh, this is, you know, this is where some of those incredibly smart people I was talking about earlier, they get to be the instructors. So they're going to dig into how do consumers behave or do the social sociological and psychological aspects behind that, what's current research in that. There's a wonderful class in market research that's gonna get deeply into the quantitative elements, um, often linked tightly with market research, but it's designed specifically to dig into the quantitative and qualitative research that can be conducted, how to, how to analyze, how to report out. Um, uh, I've been generally teaching a course called Integrated Marketing Communications, which is very focused on the true communications element, often referred to in the four Ps as the promotion, which is a silly title, um, almost as silly as place being distribution. Um, but there are also classes that, that are kind of blended. And so there's a data analytics class that the students absolutely adore. Chun Hao uh, Wu teaches that, it's amazing. Um, there are classes that kind of go across disciplines. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm trying to think of one off the top of my head and I know there's a strategic class. There's one um, it's taught by a marketing professor. It's about kind of more of the 
how does one become a good leader utilizing some of the techniques that come from those ideas? So it's kind of a quasi leadership class, but it's actually based in some marketing principles. So, um, oh, and I've got, um, I don't know if it's Smita or Smita, but I would love to have you join in if you're comfortable. Yeah, hi, uh, this is Smita. Uh -huh. And yeah, and thank you so much. I just want to quickly say thank you for your uh, lecture. And uh, also, I just wanted to mention that I come from a software or engineering background. And this is exactly something what I was looking for. And uh, <laughs> this, is, this is the reason because I have worked in uh, a retail domain before, but uh, not really into the business uh, perspective. Probably that is the reason this. I, I just want to quickly uh, ask one question, uh, whether this ma like related to marketing and positioning, is this going to be like an elective or something that uh, is a general uh, session, which will be for all? Um, I teach this class, so I know that it's part of the curriculum. So I can mm -hmm. say with assurance, at least see seemingly, right? We'll see how it goes, but um, it would definitely be something you learn. And um, each one of the professors, and they do a marvelous job of this because we discuss these things but behind the scenes is, Many of the professors are so good at identifying what are some of the most important core principles that allow you, because you're arguably, you're presumably, you're taking an MBA, at least why I took an MBA and why I talked to a lot of students about taking MBAs, is you want to become a leader. You want to become someone who isn't necessarily just doing something, right. but you are engaging and involving other people in doing that as a team and maybe holding that accountability. And if that's what you wanna do, it's so important to have a good window of understanding into yes. all of the different aspects of business. And I think the professors do a marvelous job of pulling out some of those core principles, like positioning being one of them. That if you understand that, now a lot of what those marketing people talk about makes sense. Oh, that, we're doing that because it's not about me. We're doing that because it's about that person. That can be just as illuminating as, oh, that technique makes me value that business differently than I would have intuitively gotten there because this technique was something I wasn't made aware of or, or wasn't available as I went through my own education. So hopefully that gives you more perspective on, on, um, on how that kind of comes together and a more global look at it. Right. Uh, but I just wanted to know uh, whether these kind of sessions would be uh, like elective or they would be. No, these, this is different. required. The, the required. basic right. marketing okay. class is required. The basic accounting class okay. is required. You have choices between a high level and a, and a general level finance class. Right. Um, each one of these things is, is part of that core curriculum you take during the first three periods. Okay, sure. Thank you so much. Anne. Of course. No, thanks. Sorry, I didn't get it the first time. Yeah. Great, thank you so much, Anne, and thank you everyone for um, your participation during this lecture. Um, and so, uh, thank you so much for making the time for this um, informative lecture on this important topic area. And um, hopefully some of you would have a chance to take one of um, Anne's courses and um, learn further from um, her expertise uh, in marketing and in business. So now we're gonna go on to an overview section of the full-time MBA program. Um, so this is where you can learn a little bit more about what the program looks like. Um, for those of you that didn't catch it, my name is Vivian Tran and I'm an admissions and recruitment manager at the UBC Slaughter School of Business. And I recruit for the full-time MBA program as well as for the um, part-time MBA program. So I'm just gonna get my presentation up on the screen here. There go. So um, during this presentation, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what makes our MBA special. Um, features like our global immersion program, uh, focus on experiential learning, case-based learning, and um, personalized career development are all aspects of the UBC MBA program that makes it a strong program, that makes it a program that has strong academic rigor, but also a strong emphasis on how you apply the new skills that you're learning into solving actual business cases. And of course, a lot of you are here looking for a career transition or looking for career advancement. So there is a, that very strong focus on career development um, coaching and um, learning how to advance your skills and navigate the uh, career advancement process. So I'll go over all these different pillars of what makes our MBA, uh, UBC MBA strong um, in a little bit more detail as we go through this presentation. 
So a little bit about the reputation of the UBC MBA program. Um, it is one of the top 100 global MBA schools in the world. We are ranked number one in business um, and economics in Canada. And we also have 43,000 alumni in 80 countries around the world. So these 43,000 alumni, that's only the Sauter Business Network. UBC is of course a top 40 university in the world. So um, UBC by itself has about um, 300,000 alumni in 140 countries around the world. So, uh, so, so we do have the larger UBC network as well as the smaller close-knit um, Sauter network, which is still 43,000 alumni in 80 countries around the world. Um, so a little bit about Vancouver, for those of you that aren't from the city. Um, it is one of the fast, uh, it's always considered one of the most livable cities in North America, always ranked by um, ranking systems like The Economist, by the United Nations, as one of the most livable cities in the world. It has Canada's fastest growing metropolitan um, economy, and it's home to businesses, both large and small, um, from large firms like Amazon, Microsoft, SAP, McKinsey, to um, born in Vancouver firms like Lululemon, for example. Um, and it is, also geostrategically located on the west, on kind of um, the Asia Pacific gateway of North America, as well as having close connections to Silicon Valley, again, geostrategically close to Silicon Valley and on the west coast of North America. So two important hubs there and Vancouver is at the center of it all. So wonderful city to li live in. You can see this beautiful um, picture of the city. We're right on the coast um, with mountains and, um, and just a beautiful metropolitan city, but like close to nature as well. This is what the full-time MBA journey looks like. So this is the first half of the program. So you can see that the program starts with foundational courses. So that will be kind of your um, business basics in marketing, um, in economics, in finance, in statistics, operations. And um, you can see that as you go through the foundational courses, you'll also do major case studies. Now, um, when you get to the end of the foundational period of the program, you'll actually work on a consulting project for a local firm. So not only are you learning how to apply your, um, the knowledge that you're learning in your classrooms into actual case studies as you're going through the program, but the program also helps you build your resume with like hands-on learning with actual companies as you go through the program. So it's helping you to strategically build your resume as you go through the program. So once you um, complete the consulting project, you'll be on to the Christmas period. And then when you come back from the Christmas break, you'll be on to your career track modules and electives. Um, and then uh, you can also see that the global immersion experience will happen in the February of the program. I'll talk a little bit about the career tracks in just a moment, but this is the second half of the program. So you can see that by the second half of the program, we ramp up the experiential learning component of your um, experience by um, having you do the summer experience period, which is either a paid internship um, or an entrepreneurial project. So a lot of our students will choose the paid internship. There is a return on investment um, as you work for a company and gain experience. Um, or if you are an entrepreneur, there's also seed funding opportunities um, through the university. And not to mention the fact that there's accelerators and launch pads that are right at the university itself. So if you are an aspiring entrepreneur, um, UBC is home to E. At UBC, which is our entrepreneurial launchpad, as well as accelerators like um, Create, Create a Destruction Lab West. Um, so um, if you have an idea for an app or you need someone to help you program an app or something like that, like you probably find the expertise and talent right on the campus itself, which is really exciting. Now that would take you to the end period of the program, which is either three months, um, the last few months of doing electives in Vancouver, or you can go on optional international exchange. Um, so there's no additional charge to go on international exchange, as, as you would know, for those of you that have done international exchange in the past, um, but we do have 34 exchange partners on six continents around the world. So most likely anywhere you want to go, except if you want to see those cute penguins that was referenced in all those clips that Anne showed, um, you probably have to do that experience by yourself, but very likely anywhere else, we very likely have an exchange partner um, for you to choose from. Um, now you can see throughout the course of the program, um, career and professional development is um, 
kind of there for you for the duration of your time at UBC as an MBA student, but something to keep in mind, and it's a huge value added to the program, is that um, you also have career, um, career development and support throughout the course of, like throughout your career, basically. So we have alumni services for students that graduate from, graduate into the Sauter family. And so anytime down the line in your career, if you need career services, or you wanna get insight into another market, you can always reach back um, to our Business Career Center and talk with an alumni career coach and they can kind of get you connected as well. So these services that you get um, starting as an MBA student at UBC, they're there to support you for the rest of your career. So that's a huge, value added that um, is definitely worth mentioning. Now a little bit about the career tracks that I mentioned. So we do have four distinct career tracks, one in technology and analytics leadership, that's our newest track, and another one in finance, um, a third one in products and service management, and a fourth one in innovation entrepreneurship. But um, something to keep in mind is that a lot of our students actually choose to customize their career track before across the four different tracks, or even um, take courses outside of the um, Sauter Business School. So actually up to one third of your elective space could be um, taken outside of the Sauter Business School. So if there was a course in the Faculty of Law, for example, that you think would really complement your career aspirations, or let's say you're an engineer and you have the prerequisites to take a course in AI with the Department of Computer Science, you could, as long as you get the permission of your course instructor, as well as the permission of your academic director, you could take that course and have those credits credited towards um, your MBA program. So that's one of those unique features of going to a top tier international institution like UBC is that there's other departments that you can collaborate with. Not just like if you're an entrepreneur and you, you want to find programmers and other talent within the UBC community to help you launch something, but also within um, the curriculum, you can also customize um, if you wanted to customize within um, what we have offered offering um, at the UBC Sauter School of Business or even outside um, with the larger UBC um, community. So that's quite interesting as well. Um, in terms of the technology and analytics leadership track, like I mentioned, it's one of our newest tracks and it's you know, designed to give our MBA graduates the skills to lead in this evolving digital age that's increasingly looking at data, right? So you learn to lead in technology industries, but also consult with companies um, that would value kind of the, the skills and data analysis and visualization that you're gonna bring after taking um, a specialization in, in, in our technology and analytics leadership track. So some of the courses in this track include courses in data visualization, AI commercialization, um, machine learning, for example. Um, yeah, and then in terms of experiential learning, like I said, this is a fundamental part of this MBA program. So, um, you know, in addition to the major case studies that you're going to be doing in the beginning of the program, there's also um, it, the internship or entrepreneurial project that you'll be doing, as well as a capstone project at the end of the program. Now the summer experience, um, like I said, there's a return on investment for doing this kind of paid internship uh, uh, experience. So the internship students are, are typically remunerated about $3,000 to $6,000 a month up to four months. So it's an ROI of approximately 12 to 24,000 while you're studying at UBC, or you can launch an entrepreneurial project. And I did mention like there, there is seed funding for those that choose to forego a paid internship to do an entrepreneurial project. Global experiences, um, we have a range of them. So one would be our global network of advanced management. There's also global immersion, which is our global consulting project and international exchange. So UBC Sauter um, is the only Canadian member of the Global Network of Advanced Management. So this is a network spearheaded by the Yale School of Management, and it includes 30 leading business schools around the world. And they include schools like Berkeley, for example, IE University in Spain, and of course, Yale, and also schools like Oxford. So um, really prestigious schools there. And what happens under this um, network is that they, these, all 30 of these network schools will offer global network weeks. So these are opportunities for you to go abroad to one of these institutions and learn on a thematic topic area, or you can also do courses online if you wanted to stay in, in Vancouver instead. These are just some examples of some global network weeks and themes. So you can see they usually have a regional or institutional event to them. Um, so for example, you can see Berkeley had done um, a global network week on Bay Area Innovation Entrepreneurship. Um, uh, Yale University has done them on the behavioral science of management, and UBC's run its own network weeks on the sustainable, um, sustainable development goals. 
So um, those are great ways to add, um, to kind of uh, switch out some of your elective courses with co uh, courses in an international learning environment. But also because of this partnership with Yale University, we also offer a dual degree with Yale as well. So it would be the UBC MBA degree combined with the Yale Master's of Advanced Management degree. So these two degrees, if you do them separately, will usually take you one year and nine, uh, sorry, three years to do if you did the two degrees separately. But in the dual format, because there's some double counting between the two degrees, um, basically, it would just take you one year and nine months time. So the format will be the first year, the first 12 months would be at um, UBC in Vancouver. And then the next nine months would be at Yale. And when you graduate in one year and nine months time, you would have two degrees, one from UBC and one from Yale, and you'd have access to both networks. Now, it's also important at this juncture to mention that um, when you graduate from a degree in Canada, for those of you that are international and hoping to pursue careers in Canada, that um, you know you have eligibility to apply for something called a post-graduation work permit. So that's a work permit up to three years, and you know it's not a lottery system. You don't have a, to have a job in hand. It's basically an open work permit, and um, you can apply for it once you graduate. And so. Um, if you do this dual degree with Yale, you would still be eligible for the post-graduation work permit in Canada. So I bring that up just because I know like you're thinking, oh, I'm going to the United States. Like, do I still, am I still eligible for the work permit? And the answer to that is yes. So um, Yale a dual degree with UBC MBA degree, a tremendous opportunity for those that are interested in having both a Canada US experience. And of course, I always think of it as like having both coasts of North America, right? Like you have the East coast um, and then you have the West coast and um, two prestigious degrees in both countries. So very amazing opportunity there. If you have any questions about that, I'll be sending a follow-up email after this event. So feel free to send an email if you want to learn a bit more about the Yale dual degree with UBC or you had any questions about this presentation. Um, ex international exchange is a separate opportunity from the um, Masters of Advanced Management partnership. So we have multiple international partnerships with the UBC Saudi School of Business. So, um, you know, international exchange is another one of them. So we do have 34 exchange partners all around the world. And like I mentioned, on six continents. Um, personalized career coaching, another fundamental part of this degree program. Um, you would have access to a professional career coach, um, um, mentorship programs. There is also career training programs in specific disciplines. Like for example, if you want to go into management consulting, we have the strategy consulting mentorship program, which if you can pass that boot camp, you're guaranteed first round interviews with all the consulting firms in Canada. So that's a great way to launch into that very competitive um, career. And that's just one example of the types of programming that the Business Career Center offers to our MBA students. Our Business Career Center has also done um, a significant investment into developing um, an, an emotional intelligence training program. So they partnered with a firm called Roche Martin and um, they developed like there's like basically all students will go through initial kind of um, EQ kind of testing and profiling to see what areas, what em emotional intelligence areas you're strong in and what areas you can improve on so that you can build a more and more complete EQ profile that will basically help you lead more effectively in the world. Now, now, emotional intelligence is one of those skills that a lot of people say are one of the most important skills that are um, going to be necessary in, you know, in a fairly uncertain future, right? So that helps you, these skills will help you build better relationships with other human beings, you know, manage difficult emotions, cr um, increase creativity and innovation and lead others effectively. But it's also one of those skills that I think are quite amorphous for a lot of people. How do you measure it? How do you get better at it? So um, what the Business Career Center at UBC has done as has basically built like a very comprehensive program on how you can actually measure your success in terms of developing your own EQ profile. So that's that's definitely quite um, amazing what they've been doing and definitely something worth mentioning to you as one of those value additives of, of the um, UBC MBA program. So a little bit about career outcomes from this program. Um, you can see from the data from the last couple of years, um, around 80% of our students are employed within 90 days of graduation. Um, average base salary is around 90,000 to start, of course, with a range of salaries. Like it depends on what industries our grads could uh, go in, but like salary range could be up to over $200,000 for more lucrative um, industries. You can see um, examples of career changers. Um, so these are people that have changed both um, job types and um, industry types. And then career enhancers are people that tend to stay in the industry that they, they started off with before they um, entered the MBA program and then just ended up in more strategy and leadership oriented roles by the end of the program. 
you can see this is um, a profile of what our last class looked like. So you can see we're starting to pull um, towards gender parity, which is really exciting. Um, it's something rare to see in an MBA program. It's something we're very proud of and continue to work on is um, reaching gender parity. Um, you can see that our grads come from all different backgrounds, um, engineering, business, science, social science, economics, humanities. So there's no right background or one background that we choose our students from. So if you're ever wondering if we choose students based on types of backgrounds that we're specifically looking for, the answer is no. Anyone can benefit from an MBA program. You just, know, you just need to know what you want to get out of it. Um, so that's my advice in terms of knowing what background it is. You just have to be ready to um, benefit from what an MBA offers. You can see there's a range of ages. Again, we're not looking for a specific age. Um, last year, there was anywhere from 24 to uh, 43 was the age um, that our students came from. Average years of work experience was six. And uh, a percentage of international students, um, about 41% last year, usually around 50% for this class. And of course, a variety of um, work experience by industry as well. So admission requirements, um, so academic achievement, we're looking for about a B plus or 76% average on a 100 point scale. Um, and then GMAT or GRE, the competitive score for GMAT would be a 650 and then GRE would be a 320 plus. And then you can see the minimum scores um, next to it there. Minimum of two years of full-time work experience after graduation, and then a minimum of two professional references. So ideally one has to be from someone you report directly to either in a current or a previous position. And then another one could be someone that knows you well in a professional context. Um, a variety of small written essays, um, two 250 word essays, one 500 word essay. So it's important to really reflect on the question and answer succinctly. And then a 90 second video application. So just a little bit about the video application. Um, you know, it's, um, if you're not a video editor, don't panic. We're looking for content over, um, over anything else. If you have good content, that will be enough. Answering the question reflectively and like, you know, with, with um, you know, that shows that you really thought about the content of the question. But if you have good video editing skills, you're more than welcome to like really show us your talent in that way as well. And you can always see examples of what people have submitted in the past. If you just Google UBC MBA application video on YouTube and you'll find the ones that have been left as open links as inspiration to you all. Um, English proficiency tests, um, those are waived if you did a degree in English. So if you did a bachelor's degree in English, if you did a master's degree in English, then that, that test is waived. If you do need an English proficiency test, um, we're looking for um, seven on the IELTS academic. So that would be like an average of seven or 100 on the TOEFL. Um, personal interview is the last stage of the process. So um, that's about like a 30 to 45 minute interview um, that happens at the last stage of the process. Um, so in terms of dates and deadlines, the next deadline coming up is January 6, 2022. Um, so watch out for that deadline. That's also the final deadline if you want to apply for a GMAT or GRE waiver. So make sure that you complete your application by January 6 if you are applying for a waiver of the GMAT GRE. Um, tuition uh, fees here, you can see um, for Canadian and international students. And then 35 to 45% of the MBA class will be typically eligible for a scholarship, and they range anywhere from 10 to 40,000. And then I'll just um, break for questions right now. I see already there's some questions in the chat, so I'm going to open that up. Um, but if you um, have other questions, feel free to, if you want to uh, ask questions um, just using um, your mic, feel free to just uh, raise your hand and I'd be happy to get to those questions as well. Uh, okay, let's see here. Let me make sure no one is, okay. Okay, Nishant, um, your GMAT score is great. Um, years of work experience is, you know, like 3.4 3 years is also good and B plus is great. So like, I, I think you meet the criteria. So then you're gonna be working on the qualitative aspects of your application. So like I said, and same, app, same advice goes to everyone else is to really think about what the MBA means for you, what your short and long-term career goals are, but um, on what you've offered us, like that looks like it meets like, you know, like the requirements for sure. Yes, Azar, you can apply. Um, I believe if you're if you're domestic, you can apply until May. There's a slightly earlier deadline for um, international students. Great, um, Ang Angkan, like you have your hand up. Feel free to pose your question.
Hi, um, I had two questions. One was that I know you guys have a uh, rolling admissions thing. So how much of the class is, uh, are there specific quotas as you go through the year or is there a possibility that all the places will be filled before the last deadline? We don't have, so that's a good question. There's no quotas, um, but um, I mean, theoretically speaking on a rolling basis, like if we get a ton of great applications in the first few rounds, like theoretically speaking, the, the spots could all be taken up by the final round, which is why we always recommend students apply early. But in practice, we've always, we're not in the business of just filling spots to just fill spots. We're looking for very high quality um, applicants that are not just strong coming into the program, but will benefit from our program. So usually even towards the end, we'll find spots for our for students that are highly qualified. But um, but our recommendation is always to apply early because you know we have more spots at the beginning and also more scholarship money. So the earlier you apply, the more advantageous it is, but don't despair. Like there's a likelihood we'll find a spot for you as well. Like if you are a very strong candidate towards the end. Well, another question. Actually, I've, I've already applied and I'm going to uh, give my interview soon. Uh, I had a question that, um, so once they've evaluated and asked for an interview, does that mean that uh, basically how big is the shortlist compared to everyone applying? I can't divulge the um, application numbers. I just can say that it is a competitive process and we get multiple times um, more applications than we have spots. Again, it's just up to you. Like think about yourself and your application more so than how you rank relative to everyone else. We're looking for good candidates. Um, so, you know, like if it's not a good fit, then we would leave the seat empty rather than fill it with someone that's not going to benefit from our program. So think clearly about like, you know, what, you know, you've already been called to interview. So obviously like you've everything looks good so far. So now it's the interview. So think about like, you know, like any other aspects of you that, you know, it might not be reflected, written and be prepared to answer those questions. We're just, with the interview, we're just trying to answer questions about you that we haven't seen yet, you know, come out on your application. So just be able to like, know your raison d'etre, like know why you have chosen to join the MBA program at UBC and what you want to get out of it. And that will help you prepare best um, given everything else that you've already prepared um, in terms of your application. All right, thank you, Vivian. Thank you. Um, okay, let's see. So uh, what are the total course credits required for MBA completion? Um, it's 51 credits for the full-time MBA program. I think I see another question. Um, Nishant, you've asked for um, opportunities in operations or logistics sector. It would be great if you could like, um, you mean like, if you mean career opportunities, I would say that it is definitely a growing sector. Um, specifically, um, if you, you know, you're working with analytics, for example. Um, so the technology and analytics leadership track could be a really good, um, you know, uh, career track to pursue if you were looking for opportunities in the operation logistics sector just because they're relying heavily on data right now so um so that i would say is, is definitely a growing sector and those are the types of skills that um that th that sector is is looking for right now and it's also a, a skill set that's highly in demand in many other sectors as well okay just making sure um, i'm not missing any questions here Farrar, um, Farrar has mentioned, I have one year, seven months work experience, taking a break from work to focus on my applications. Am I el still eligible for application if I have two years before, before the program starts, i.e. after the application? So the two year um, work experience requirement is calculated from the time that you leave your job before you start the program. So if you are just at the cusp, like you are, you are eligible. Um, but as a younger applicant, we would want to see that level of maturity that, you know, you know what you want to get out of the program, you know, you have career goals in mind, and that we, when we look at your application and what you tell us about yourself and what your goals are, that you are ready to undertake an MBA program and you're ready to benefit from the MBA program. So if you can demonstrate those things, then yes, your application could be, um, you know, you could be ready for an MBA and you might, may also be successful in getting into the program. 
Um, Smita has asked, is there a maximum work experience and or age limit? No, there is no maximum years of work experience, nor is there an age limit. Um, so like I said earlier, we are not looking for a specific age for people to join the MBA program, nor are we looking for, you know, specific industry or number of years of work experience or, um, or anything like that. Like we're just looking for people wherever they are in their career that know what they want to learn from the MBA program, what they want to benefit from the MBA program, and also um, what, how they plan to leverage their MBA program into some clearly defined career goals. So um, yeah, so that's what I would say to that question. Monica has asked, uh, let's see. Okay, so Monica, your GPA is quite close to the 3.3. Uh, that is fine, you're, you're not far off. I would say to make your application stronger because you're slightly off from our um, you know, competitive GPA, just try to score within the competitive range for the GMAT or GRE, and that will mitigate any kind of like lower grades you might've had in your undergrad GPA. Okay, I see a question here about um, references. I'll just try to expand my chat box so that it can read this a bit more quickly. In terms of references, is it, oh, Chanda has asked in terms of references, is it okay to provide both references from the same company since I didn't work very long, a uh, very long time for other employers? Yes, that's fine, Chandra. Like if you have high quality references from one company, that is fine as, as long as you have one that is um, uh, someone that you reported directly to. Um, competitive, um, Ali, competitive score for the GMAT would be a 650 or higher. Uh, Ankan, you have another question that I can help answer. Ankan, if you're asking the question, just to note you're mute right now. Okay, perhaps he had put his hand up by accident. <laughs> Um, okay, great. So, I mean, we are at this point, um, I'll take one more question, but we are rolling towards the end of the event. Um, course duration is showing 16 months for full-time MBA in case of time extension for any semester, which other specific interesting elective subjects, then what time is, okay. So in terms of elective courses, you can swap out some of your elective courses with courses outside of the business school. Um, for example, but or take an international exchange, but the program is normally finished within um, 16 months. Um, do we have co-op or other equivalent opportunities? So co-op, if you're talking about like working while studying, um, we don't really have that component in this program. We have more of like the, the internship, the paid internship component. You're basically working full time. So you're not coming into courses usually at that time. Um, so it's usually a full time working opportunity. Um, and then like, like, I guess our internships at the beginning of the program and our global immersion experience can be almost like a co-op because you're basically consulting for firms while you're still studying. So that would be a little bit more like your typical co-op experience. But the summer work experience will be basically like a full-time job. Great. So we are out of time, unfortunately, at this point. So um, I'd like to thank you all again for making the time to come up to this event. I hope you found it as inspiring as I did to listen to Anne's lecture. And um, we will be sending you a, um, a follow-up email after this event. So if there's further questions about anything you heard on this lecture or anything you didn't hear, um, feel free to send us an email. Thank you so much, uh, wherever you are in the world. And um, thank you for the time and your interest in um, the UBC MBA program. Have a good night. or. Good morning, wherever you are.